How many of you feel that reality uh, alive in you this morning that Jesus changed your story? That your life was changed by what Jesus Christ did in you? So often for us, we, we as believers, we kind of we like, we have this experience, we have this situation that takes place in our lives, and um, we lose sight of the fact uh, so quickly that God did something different in you, changed you, changed your life, changed your trajectory, changed your testimony. That the life you live today is completely different because of what Jesus Christ did in you. We're in the, uh, we're in the middle of a series um, entitled, What's the Difference? We started it last week, and it's a study in, in 2 Peter. And I think that's an important truth that we need to, to integrate into this conversation. Because there is a difference in our lives because of Jesus Christ. We're not the same. Because Jesus did something in our lives. Um, the conversation we're having in 2 Peter, it really is something that was set up in 1 Peter. Where, P, where, for, where Peter writes in 1 Peter, and he says to the church, Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. I, uh, I said this last week, I love always reading that passage in, in King James because whenever I re- hear that, whenever I hear that Peter declares we are a peculiar people, it seems to be the most appropriate description of my experience with people in the church. How many, how many of you think you're peculiar? Right? That Peter is saying there is a difference, that because of who we are, we are different. And, and what's fascinating um, as I said last week, Peter is writing this to a church that's under persecution. And they're under persecution because they are different. They're not like everybody else. They're different. They're completely different. And what's fascinating is Peter, as you walk through this, Peter, as he's talking in 1 Peter and he's talking in 2 Peter, he doesn't, he doesn't like ask the church to try and diminish that difference. He's not like, he's not like guys, like people don't like us and, and they're like, they're like throwing us in prison, and they're like saying bad things about us, and they're, they're, they're lying about us, and they're killing us. So do what you can to kind of like be as much like them as possible. Like let's, let's build the bridge. Let's, let's try and assimilate a little bit better so we don't have as much conflict in our lives. I feel like that's kind of what Christians today try to do, right? Ain't much difference between me and you. You got your thing, we got our thing. I'm into this, you're into that. Ain't much difference. Peter, in the midst of of deep persecution for being different, he calls them to lean into their difference. Because he believes the power, the hope, the life of Jesus Christ is found in that difference. So as we walk through this, um, we, we we need to continually ask ourselves, what's the difference? What's the difference between me and those around me? What's the difference in my life? What's the difference? So that's the framework for our conversation. Um, And we began it last week looking at verses 1 and 2 as we reflected uh, on the ability of Christ uh, to multiply peace and grace to us. Um, And we said that that, that, that peace and grace are multiplied to us through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. As I said last week, the whole conversation was about how we as believers have this very unique, this very um, different experience of living in peace and living in grace. As I say that, I say that it's a different, unique experience. I, I don't think that there's many of us that could challenge that contention. Because I look around the world, as I interact with people, I, I wouldn't say that the, the defining character of their life is peace. There's a sense of grace. In fact, I see the exact opposite. So I want to pick it up today again in verse 2. So we're we're picking up again in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 2. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power is granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness 
through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Now stop there. What word do you see repeated several times over this simple um, uh, verse and a half? Just one and a half verses. What, what word do you see repeated over and over again? May grace and peace be multiplied to you in what? The knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through what? The knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. And if you were listening earlier, uh, and you were listening closely to, to the reading of this morning's text, you heard verse 8, you heard this phrase. Keep, keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in this passage, in this opening passage, in, in the verse and a half that we're focusing on this morning, he mentions the concept of the knowledge of Jesus Christ over and over and over again. Several different times. He says, he says it's rooted in this concept of the knowledge of Jesus. Now this is really important, I, I think, to take hold of. So if you want grace and peace multiplied to you, what do you need? The knowledge of Jesus Christ. And the second place, the second place in which we find this in this verse and a half, is I think even more important. If you want, now hear this, all things that pertain to life and godliness. How many think that's a big promise? If you want all things that pertain to life and godliness. How, how many of you guys are interested in your life? How many of you are interested in godliness? If you want all things that pertain to life and godliness, it comes through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So what does that mean? If we're going to read this passage and we're going to say that there's this idea, there's this concept that jumps out at the page that Peter is focusing in on is that the knowledge of Jesus Christ, and through the knowledge of Jesus Christ, we have grace and peace multiplied to us, and, and we have all things that pertain to life and godliness. What does that mean? What does the knowledge of Jesus Christ mean? For those of you who were here last week, you should remember at least a little bit um, what that means. This concept of the knowledge of Jesus Christ is this in-depth relationship. If you guys remember the, the word that was translated here, um, doesn't deal solely with this idea of knowing. So for us, we talk about knowledge, we talk about we know something. What, when, when, when it's talked about here in, in the Bible, when it's talked about it in the Greek, it's, it's this idea of this deep experiential knowledge. This, the, 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 there's, a, there's this depth to, to having um, known, to to, to having this exact, this, this complete, this, this thorough, this accurate, experiential knowledge of someone or something. It's not just this abstract or intellectual or, or head knowledge. The declaration literally means all mind, all heart, all experience in Jesus. You have to know Jesus to experience the benefits of Jesus. You have to know him. You have, you have to press into him. You have, you, you, you have to make yourself um, uh, be fully um, immersed in who Jesus Christ is. Every piece of your being, every piece of your understanding, every piece of your knowledge. What I do is I go, we, we have to go in this place where we go, Jesus is my everything. How many, of you, how many of you heard that concept in your faith? Jesus is my everything. But sincerely, how many of us live in that place? You have to know Jesus to live the benefits of Jesus, to, to experience his peace, to partake of his grace, to have everything you need for life and godliness. You need to know Jesus. I think... We have become too fixated as the church in modern times of translating attributes of Jesus. Believing that is the mission of the church. 
without introducing people to the knowledge of Jesus. The, the exact, complete, thorough, accurate, experiential knowledge of Jesus Christ. Modeling Jesus' love won't bring the grace of Jesus to someone. Modeling Jesus' forgiveness won't instill all things needed for life and godliness to someone. Modeling Jesus' sacrifice won't bring the peace of Jesus to someone. What brings that peace? What brings that grace? What brings all things that are needed for life and knowledge, life and, and godliness, is knowing Jesus on a deep level. Modeling these attributes of Jesus to people it is a good thing. It's something that Christians should do. But the truth is, if people do not know Jesus, none of that which, which, Peter, which Peter describes here is available to people. You have to know him. All of this comes through knowing Jesus. This is what makes the difference. This is what makes the difference, knowing Jesus. So what is that difference? It starts with the knowledge of Jesus Christ, knowing Christ. If you're here this morning and, and you don't know Jesus, you can honestly say in, in everything that I'm talking about right now, there's not even a starting point of your knowledge of Jesus. Maybe there's some Maybe there's some distance, maybe there's some, maybe there's some head knowledge, maybe there's this idea of, I've heard of Jesus, I've heard people talk about Jesus, but I don't know Jesus. I want you to realize that, that it comes in pressing into Him, it comes in yielding yourself to Him, it comes in living in a way in which He is all-encompassing everything. You make Him your Lord and your Savior. You realize your hope is in Him, you realize your future is in Him, you realize your identity is in Him. And then you embrace all that He is and live that out. Now even as I say that, as a part of a conversation to someone who, who maybe has not given their lives to Jesus or, or, or someone who, who would say, I don't really know Jesus, I really believe that, that admonition, that encouragement, is something that many of us who are followers of Christ need to hear and need to reflect upon. What does it mean for you to know Jesus? What does it mean for you to live in the knowledge of Jesus? See, this, this idea, this, this exact understanding, this, the, the, this precise knowledge, this, this, um, this experiential relationship that teaches us about the nature of Jesus Christ is something we as Christians too often set aside. Everything about our life is about Jesus. Our, our, our thoughts, our identity, our, our convictions, our decisions. We live in a place in which there is a depth of knowledge of Jesus Christ that governs who we are. And we really don't, many times as Christians, live there. We receive this we, 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 we have this, 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 this understanding of Christ intellectually, emotionally, and experientially when we make the decision to press into that reality, to press into that truth. Do you have that depth of knowledge of Jesus? Because when we do, when you do, it says here we have all things that pertain to life and godliness. That seems like a lot. That seems like we're given a lot. As I look at my life, as I look at what it means to live my life, and I see it not just on the macro, but I see it on the micro, where every single day I am encountering situations and circumstances that challenge me. Challenge my spirit, challenge my mind, challenge my soul, challenge my existence, challenge who I am. How do I interact with people? What decisions do I make? What words come out of my mouth? This is the life we live, right? 
when we talk about him giving us all things we need for life, this is the life we're talking about. There is a challenge every single day where I have to interact with people, where I have to make decisions, where I've got to choose the direction I'm going to go. How many of you know that I'm just describing everyone's life, right? And what he's saying is, in the knowledge of God, we can have all we need for that life. All things that pertain to life. When we look at life every day, we face circumstances and situations that in our knowledge of him, he will be equipping us. I focus on this, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of pushing on this, because the reality is, Jesus is here to equip you in all things about all your life. The gospel in Jesus Christ pertains to everything. When I get the knowledge of Jesus Christ, when I understand who he is, when I understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is, which is his life, his teaching, his miracles, his sacrifice, his death, his resurrection, his glorification. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. And when I understand that and I pull that into me, I, 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 and I take that and I apply it, this is the life a believer lives differently than everybody else. See, when, when I find myself in situations within my marriage, when I, when I find myself with, with, with situations within my marriage, do you realize that the gospel of Jesus Christ, the knowledge of Jesus Christ, has given you everything you need as it pertains to your marriage? It, it, it teaches us how we should interact with our, with our husbands, how we should interact with our wives. I can go to Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her washing her by the word, so that he may present her to himself. A pure and holy bride. See, I look at it, and what it teaches me in this is it says, Jesus Christ loved in a way in which he was willing to sacrifice for the good of his bride. That he looked at it and he said, it's not my way, it's not my wants that I live for but it is the needs of my bride. It is the needs of the object of my love. The, Jesus Christ, the knowledge of Jesus Christ teaches us how to love. So when I find myself in a situation or a circumstance in which I'm challenged in my marriage, I have to go back and I have to see what is the knowledge of Jesus Christ? What does Jesus Christ teach me about this? How many of you guys ever find yourself in marriage and you're thinking, it would be really great if I had a manual on what to do now. The knowledge of Jesus Christ has given you everything you need to live him out in your marriage. The knowledge of Jesus Christ has given me everything I need as it relates to when I'm mistreated. Jesus Christ teaches us how we can encounter uh, oppression, how we can encounter being mistreated. How he, how, he, how he stood and he faced those who, who falsely accused him, those who abused him. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He, he, he taught us and he said how we should turn the other cheek, how we, should, how we should love those who hate us. Pray for those who despitefully use us. He, he taught us what it means to be, to, to, to respond when somebody does us wrong and how to live in forgiveness towards them. When, 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 when Peter said to Jesus, how often should I forgive my brother? And he, what did he say? Seventy times seven, or as often as you want the Father in heaven to forgive you. See, we find it, everything I'm talking about is life, Right? It's challenges in marriages. It's, it's being mistreated by others. It's, it's being offended. It's, this is life. And the knowledge of Jesus Christ, the experiential, total knowledge of Jesus Christ, not just a head knowledge, but a heart knowledge, a spirit knowledge of Jesus Christ, equips us every single day. If we've come to this point in which we've said, I have the knowledge of Jesus Christ, 
Our knowledge, experiential, totally immersive, knowledge of Jesus Christ gives us everything we need to navigate life. And where we fail is in the every moment, every day application of that knowledge. You love the fact that Jesus Christ was forgiving to you, forgave your sins, and brought you salvation. But you struggle with translating the forgiveness He gave you to forgiving others. You love the fact that Jesus Christ sacrificed on the cross for your salvation, but you struggle with sacrificing for your husband or your wife for their good. This is the issue. It's not that the knowledge of Jesus Christ has not equipped us. It's the fact that He has given us what we need and we struggle to apply it. And that's the same issue that arises when it comes to all things that pertain to godliness. We are called to live lives of godliness. And how many of you guys ever feel like you fall short of that? We're called to live lives of godliness. And for many of us, we fall short of that idea. We fall short of that place. But I want you to understand, I want to make sure that we clarify and have a clear understanding of what godliness is here. Quite often, um, we focus on the idea uh, that godliness or, or living a godly life is about not sinning, right? I'm really struggling to, to live a, a godly life. And although that is, um, that is a part of this concept, um, this passage, this, this word that's used here is meant to convey so much more. And that's what we need to get out of this. Greek word here is a combination of two words. Uh, it's you and sabome. And it literally means to worship well. Literally means to worship well. So the translation here is our life is a life that worships well. It's an, it, it, this, the, the phrase here reflects an attitude of one's life to live with a sense of, of God's presence and a desire motivated by love to be pleasing to Him in all things. In everything we say, in everything we do, in everything we think. It's this, it's this inner attitude of reverence which then manifests itself into God's pleasing activity. Think about that. Do you live your life in reverence to God? Do you worship well with the life you live? Do you realize His presence is everywhere? His presence is in you? And therefore you need to make your life, you need to make your every choice a worship before God? An offering to Him, a, a reverence before Him? Len Swinock applies it like this. He says, the godly man or woman lives above the petty things of life, the passions and pressures that control the lives of others. Supernatural life and godliness are not native to the human heart, but only the result of God's gift. When we ask the question, what's the difference? Here you see it leaping off the page at you, doesn't it? This is the difference, right? If, if, if we as Christians are called to, with our lives, worship well, to a life of godliness, worshiping well, how would that not be distinctive from people who don't acknowledge God or acknowledge Jesus? Your life is meant to be given to Him as a sacrifice of worship, in reverence to Him. When we ask the question, what's the difference? The answer is, in our knowledge of Christ, we live lives that worship well. We live lives looking for one singular purpose, to please Him 
in all we say and all we do. So the experiential, totally immersive knowledge of Jesus gives us everything we need for life and godliness. But what's interesting is that what we discover in the text we've just read is that none of this really matters. None of this this really comes to fruition if if we don't take time to embrace the second element that empowers this unique life and this focused godliness. We said that it was through the knowledge of Jesus Christ that that we can receive all that we need for life and godliness. And it is true that it is through the knowledge of Jesus Christ that we can find and discover all that we need for life and godliness. But Peter also says that this comes by His divine power. His divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us. This difference comes through the experiential, all-consuming knowledge of Christ when it is activated, given, granted by the power of God. How many of you, when you hear that, there's a certain part of you that kind of gets happy to know that it's not on me. That it's not in my ability. It's not in my strength. It's not in what I can do. But living this life in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, taking the knowledge of Jesus Christ that is all-consuming in my existence as a Christian and translating it into my life to live a life of godliness is empowered not by my... my, my, my um, uh, my ability, my, my discipline, uh, my, my stick to But it happens through the power of Jesus Christ. John Piper gives a great explanation of the central need for the power of God in the life of the believer when he says, the Christian faith is not merely a set of doctrines to be accepted. It is a power to be experienced. It is a tragic thing to ask people if they know the Lord and have them start listing the things they believe about the Lord. Brothers and sisters, believing things about Jesus Christ will save no one. The devils are the most orthodox believers under heaven. It is a divine power that saves. If the power of God does not flow into your life and make you godly, you are not Christ's. All who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. The mark of sonship is divine power. We need the power of God to live the difference. How many of you believe that to be true? How many of you believe we need the power of God to live out the difference of God? How many of you think that we need the power of God for all things that pertain to Christian life and godliness? I bet every one of us does, right? Because every time we face this challenge, every time we, somebody comes to me and says, you need, you need to live a life that reflects Jesus Christ, I'm thinking, gosh, if I have to do this myself, we're screwed. Right? Right? That's our natural thing. That's our idea. We, we, we think about it. We see, the, we see the bar that Jesus Christ has, has, has set for us that we need to measure up to. And in our own abilities, we're just going to say, I, I'm going to fail in this. Every one of us would sit and we would say, I need the power of God to live this out. But I want to ask you this question. Because I feel you have that conviction, but I want to ask you this question. I want you to ask yourself this question. What does that even mean? In a practical sense, what does it mean when we say we need the power of God? We can nod our heads and say, yes, we need the power of God. But the reality is, unfortunately, we don't seem to grasp what that power is, where that power comes from. 
how to be charged and be recharged by the power to face the trials and the temptations of everyday life. What does it mean to live by the divine power of God? What is the divine power of God? We all just a few minutes ago all agreed we need the divine power of God. We've all just agreed that, 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 that we're relying on the power, divine power of God. What is it? How do you access it? How do you live in it? Our yes to that question is irrelevant if we don't know, if we don't know the answer to this one, isn't it? I think there's an interesting clue deposited in the original language here that's translated as power. One commentator explains the word like this. Sometimes, sometimes dunamis, power, is used to represent an entity or being that functions with remarkable power. William MacDonald in his, in his commentary clarifies it even more when he says, Unlimited strength is at our disposal. Through the enabling of the Holy Spirit, the believer can serve valiantly, endure patiently, suffer triumphantly, and if need be, die gloriously. You see, the power of God in the life of the believer is the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit alive in us. We serve a living God. And the expression of the living God in this world right now for us is the Holy Spirit. The divine power that enables us to have all that we need for life and godliness is found in the Holy Spirit alive in us. And Paul makes this case precisely in his encouragement to the church in Romans chapter 8. He says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now I want to stop right there and I, I want you to focus in on what he says because he, he emphasizes it twice because he wants you to under, understand the depths of this. Do you know that Jesus Christ was risen from the dead? Do you know that? How many of you knew that? How many of you think that's remarkable? Anyone seen somebody rise from the dead lately? Right? So he says here, the power of God, the Holy Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead is in you. And then he says it again. He says, the Spirit of God that rose Jesus from the dead is in you. What, 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 Paul is, what Paul is pulling from here is he's saying that is a remarkable occurrence. The, the power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in believers. And why does he dwell in believers? He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. You see, he specifically states here, the power to live, the power to live overcoming lives, the power to break free from what this world is holding us in on is the power of the Holy Spirit alive in us. We as Christians need to not hold the Holy Spirit at arm's length. We need to step into His presence. We need to draw Him close to us. We need to understand that it is only by the Spirit of God in us that we will ever accomplish all the things that God has laid out for us. Yes, through the knowledge of Jesus Christ, He has given us all we need for life and godliness, but it will only come by the divine power of the Holy Spirit alive in the believer. God is alive in us through His power, which is the Holy Spirit. 
This is the difference. Those who do not know Jesus Christ do not have the power of the Holy Spirit alive in them and cannot, will not, ever be able to live this life. We are not left to struggle in our flesh to navigate this life. We are not left to struggle in our flesh to achieve godliness. The divine power of God, His Holy Spirit, is here to comfort, to calm, to heal, to restore. He is here to set free the believer from the slavery of sin and the calamity of this world. But we have to draw from Him. Go to Him. Rely on Him. We struggle because we live oblivious to the power we've been given. The Holy Spirit empowers you. He gives you wisdom. He gives you direction. He gives you comfort. He gives you healing. He gives you the power to go and be different than everyone else. The Holy Spirit is here. Draw on Him. In closing, I can't help but be reminded of the words of Francis Francis Chan in his book on the Holy Spirit entitled Forgotten God. And I'll tell you, the title of that book, I think, is so important for us to reflect upon. Francis Chan writes this book about the Holy Spirit, and he calls it Forgotten God because he believes that many of us as Christians have forgotten the Holy Spirit alive in us. We focus in on the work of Jesus Christ. And we embrace the truth of our Heavenly Father. But we have, we have so often ignored the Holy Spirit, which what I just read to you is where we draw the power to live in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Francis Chan writes and he says, the world is not moved by love or actions that are of human creation. And the church is not empowered to live differently from any other gathering of people without the Holy Spirit. But when believers live in the power of the Spirit, the evidence in their lives is supernatural. The church cannot help but be different. And the world cannot help but notice. If it's true that the Spirit of God dwells in us and that our bodies are the Holy Spirit's temple, then shouldn't there be a huge difference between the person who has the Spirit of God living inside of him and the person who does not? Are you committed to the difference? Do you desire to know Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit? that you will be equipped for all you need in life and all you need for God. His presence is here. The power of the Holy Spirit wants to move in your life. The power of the Holy Spirit wants to bring restoration in your life. He wants to bring healing in your life. He wants to, he wants to bring guidance into your life. He wants to bring comfort into your life. The power of God is here. Reach out and receive it.